It should come as no surprise that most of the passengers on this Tuesday, June trip to Ibiza were looking forward to a week of late-night parties. However, a few travelers were thinking of another club. Unknown to their fellow travelers, the delegation was from Old Trafford and was on its way to the White Island with the intention of bringing some sunshine of their own. Their objective was to visit Eric Ten Hag and talk about Manchester United's future when he was on vacation in the Balearics after a protracted and frequently depressing season. After weeks of rumors and semi-secret soundings out of possible successors in locations ranging from Mayfair to Monaco, the Ineos team led by new investor Sir Jim Ratcliffe came to the conclusion that the Dutchman was the most qualified candidate. Even though he was already aware of the choice, the lieutenants took off because, in typical Ineos fashion, everyone concerned had to know that everyone was aligned. Less than three weeks ago, the idea of such a thing was unimaginable. However, that was prior to two unimaginable events. In the FA Cup final, United stunned everyone by defeating City, largely due to a tactical masterclass by a man who was once dead. Confidence stoked by that improbable win also lingered, as negotiations with possible successors ended without a clear resolution. Rather than sticking or twisting, the same question kept coming up for people like Sir Dave Brailsford, Jason Wilcox, and Jean-Claude Blanc. Will things become better if we change? In the end, everyone agreed on the decision. No, Marco Silva, Roberto De Zerbi, Thomas Frank, Thomas Tuchel, and Mauricio Pochettino would not be an improvement. Ten Hag would remain. As intimidating as the treasure chest's emptiness is the enormity of the task that would have faced any of the individuals mentioned above. There is no open checkbook at United. They are destroyed by financial fair play combined with terrible transfer windows. They are looking for a manager who can bring out the best in his players and nurture talent from the academy. In the public eye, Ratcliffe has already questioned why it is necessary to pay hundreds of millions for a player like Kylian Mbappe when you can produce your own superstar. Which applicants met that criteria? The closest thing to crossing the line was Tuchel, who Ratcliffe entertained in Monaco, and the conversation ended there. But in the end, he concluded that what he needed was a vacation rather than a stint at the nation's most watched club. Regarding the other Thomas, Brentford's Frank, it never really progressed past the introductory phase. Everything was friendly. United gained some additional insight on the gifted Dane. For Brentford, this was more validation that they were on the right track, as well as the prestige of having their guy associated with one of the biggest positions in sports. Those upstairs, far more worried that Frank might travel the small distance across West London to Chelsea than 160 miles north, were not surprised by how it turned out. Pochettino is well-liked by Sir Alex Ferguson and has frequently been associated with United. However, negotiations with the Argentine began the same week he left Chelsea. It was believed that since they had hardly stopped spinning in the washing machine, they would be better off taking a break and completing a touchel. It's understood that complicating things further was the possibility of arranging a compensation arrangement with Chelsea based on the terms of his departure from Stamford Bridge. The seconds passed. According to insiders, Gareth Southgate was not given any real thought. Their reasoning now looks reasonable. If the man they actually wanted was out of the country and not accessible until July at the earliest, why would they start this process? Was Ten Hag really supposed to wait so long? No candidate stood out at any point. Each of Ratcliffe, Brailsford, and Ineos operates in a distinct manner. They have faith in their framework. A lot of elements outside the dugout that might be significantly improved were noted in the season evaluation. The key is injuries. This summer, Carrington will undergo a makeover with a focus on creating an elite atmosphere that fosters well-being and keeps injuries from ruining another season. The inability of Jose Mourinho and Luis van Gaal to succeed at United after Ferguson raises doubts about the task. The opinion is that Ten Hag needs the resources he needs to be successful. After that, there are no justifications. A four-hour summit in Ibiza followed the structure of an open, sincere, and grown-up conversation. The results of the inquiry that Ratcliffe's group had ordered were given to Ten Hag. It was analytical and methodical. A new contract and a willingness to work under the roles-defined approach that Ineos believes would bring United back to its previous glory were also discussed. 
A structure in which the technical director sets the playing style, the sporting director oversees recruitment, and the manager acts as a head coach. Ten Hag anticipates having less influence and viewing himself as a more conventional manager. It's possible that his job title will change. Ten Hag would have to shoulder some of the responsibility for a number of problems that United did not stray from, even though he still has his post. His influence over transfers and a string of misfiring acquisitions, such as the £85.5 million spent on the one-footed Anthony, who was unable to play off the bench at Wembley, will be severely curtailed. When Declan Rice and Harry Kane left for other opportunities in the summer, how did United wind up with £60 million? Mason Mount, who was out for the majority of the year, shelled out £47 million for Andrew Onana, who was free a year earlier? And what about Rasmus Hodgland, who is thought to be absurdly overpriced by United's top division opponents at £72 million plus add-ons? Ten Hag was driven towards the guillotine by these mistakes, particularly following the 4-0 loss at Crystal Palace and the chaos in the FA Cup semi-final, where United gave it their all but still lost to Championship Coventry. This time, there is only £50 million to be spent prior to player departures, and United is already in the process of selling players. Juventus and Napoli are interested in Mason Greenwood, while Borussia Dortmund's Jadon Sancho, who just had a dramatic falling out with Ten Hag, may decide to stay longer. What will happen to Marcus Rashford, who had a brilliant season in which he scored 30 goals two years ago, is still up in the air. His performance was like someone falling off a cliff in football. This season, he made headlines for quite different reasons. In October, he went out late after City crushed him 3-0 in the Derby. In January, he had a drunken night and called in sick to training. This led to his being dropped for the FA Cup match against Newport County, suggesting he was not paying attention to his manager. It is difficult to imagine a world in which, should someone get close to the fee and the salaries, the Withenshaw boy leaves for greener pastures that would be advantageous to both of them. The fact that United will consider bids for the majority of their roster, aside from a select few players like Hodgland, Alejandro Garnacho, and Kabi Menu, says volumes. The manager will delegate the responsibility of finding replacements to others. The three most important positions are centre-half, defensive midfielder, and center forward. The changing room needs to be more harmonious. Ten Hag tried to instill his ideology in his players upon his arrival, telling them that he wanted them to buzz around their opponents, like bees, when they did not have the ball. He then proceeded to make buzzing noises to illustrate his point. Sources claim that earlier in the season, some people imitated the noises while he was not looking. In any case, the manager still has the support of the majority of the players and will try to increase his own majority during this summer's elections. Lisandro Martinez launched him into the air after the cup victory. Others hurried to join in the celebration. He had obviously not lost the dressing room. The lead-up to Wembley contained the clues. As part of a collaboration between Ten Hag and the club's player engagement department, players found positive words, paintings, and sketches in their rooms at the Marriott in Maida Vale. It was not surprising at all. Ten Hag is a severe disciplinarian, but he also has compassion. He organized a family day and winter barbecue in the middle of the season, where youngsters from the players' group enjoyed face painting and bounce houses. Two inspirational movies were screened before the derby beneath the arch. In one of the videos, a female member of the club's security team talked about her experience serving in the military and getting stuck in a hamlet with her company. Outnumbered, she gave a thorough account of how the group collaborated to make their escape. Not every one of them survived. It was a clear message, they were about to face greater difficulties than those that others had overcome to succeed. They achieved triumph. Ten Hag would not have survived. That was all there was to it. But the song had abruptly altered as United supporters left Wembley. The majority expressed their desire for Ten Hag to remain and stated that he was not to blame. In that regard, Ineos has read the room well, and the response to their readiness to act has been overwhelmingly favorable. They had been talking to candidates, including Tuchel, as late as last Tuesday, but a week later they took a different tack and remained in their current location. Conversations heated up over the weekend. 
On Monday, a unanimous decision was made. The only thing left to do was get the Glazer's consent, which would never present a problem. Ten Hag's backroom team might shift while he's still there. Players had advised him to adjust his strategy at different points during the previous season, which saw United finish 8th, end up with a negative goal difference, and fall out of Europe after a dismal performance in the Champions League. In fact, several at the club questioned whether Ten Hag required new leadership or fresh perspectives in addition to him on the bench. The conversation in Ibiza, which will carry over to Manchester, focused on the club's ability to grow from its failures. How can they improve going forward? Even though the manager stays the same, everything will be completely changed. Omar Barada took over as chief executive in July after joining Manchester City. He will work with Dan Ashworth as the sporting director, and Jason Wilcox, the new technical director, will also be there. Even with the sharing of the workload, it's still a big task. Though contract negotiations are still going on, it's thought that Ten Hag, whose contract expires at the end of the upcoming season, would receive an additional two years. He might require it as well as the new Manchester United.